Thank you. I'm totally wired here, so if I trip or anything, you, you'll understand, right? Dr. Stevenson, thank you for that gracious welcome. It is a real pleasure for me to be here this evening. I'm amazed uh, actually to see anybody in the room, partly I don't know why you've come here to hear me, um, but secondly, knowing how precious your time is and what a busy place Blacksburg is this week. So, community voices tonight, Martin Sheen tomorrow night, congratulations. <laughs> your list of past speakers is impressive and highlights directly how a large research university like Virginia Tech can make great contributions to public policy discussions. I love the way that Virginia Tech's people collaborate. It seems to me that scientists, engineers, educators, theater majors have clearly found a way to communicate in some kind of common language with public policy experts to find innovative solutions to the challenges that real people like you and me face. I have a lot to learn from you. I hope tonight we'll have a dialogue. And just as a little detour, Max, as you said, like you, I received my undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia. But I noticed that you also received all of your graduate education at Virginia. Uh, that would be UVA. And I was just wondering how widely you advertise that little factoid here at Tech. <laughs> you know, aside from being alums from UVA, it might not seem that Max and I have much in common. But we both live in Salem. We both face that traffic up Christiansburg Mountain and the blasting. We both know at least one nurse well. And our sons are the same age. A dozen years or so ago, our sons had the same short little brown hair and similar body builds. And on their little league baseball team, they looked so much alike that neither the coaches nor us parents could tell them apart. Rooting for those boys was a real community voice. So Max, it's nice to connect, reconnect at least, and to catch up with Scott and your whole family. Thanks very much to you and to Andy for including me tonight. And for those in the audience that don't know it, Dr. Stevenson has written and spoken extensively about the interactions between traditional nonprofits, non-governmental advocacy organizations, and public and private policymakers. It's safe to conclude that his work to push entities with competing agendas to work a little harder to recognize each other's problems and commonalities, tone down the rhetoric, perhaps listen, and build workable consensus on the real issues that matter. Thank you, Max. In today's media-driven Facebook, Twitter, Google-driven world, and, and as an aside, I have to tell you that I used to think friend meant somebody that I hold dear and was a noun. Today, it seems to be a verb for 800 of your BFFs. And I used to think viral was something that gave you a tummy ache or a temperature. It's a whole new world out there. And yes, in today's media-driven, Facebook, Twitter, Google-driven world, the court of public opinion often has greater impact on public policy than do courts of law and traditional governing bodies. It seems to me that there is no question but that the media has caused a regrettable dumbing down of the collective American intellect. We are more interested in the antics of Lady Gaga than the presidential debate. And in the process, I fear we lose an important part of the social fabric of American values. Accordingly, Americans do not rely upon the traditional media to be watchdogs, as may have been the case in the past. That partially explains how non-governmental agencies have taken on new roles as non-traditional watchdogs of private sector business practices. Organizations like mine like it when advocacy nonprofit groups talk about how well Carillion is doing to address certain issues. 
but candidly, we don't feel quite the same when those similar groups publicly raise issues which are not so flattering. And perhaps even more concerning is how advocacy groups and the public in general can understand the healthcare industry, discern good practices from not so good practices, ethical business practices from not so ethical ones, high quality care from so-so quality. There are any number of organizations out there, just look it up on Google, and you'll find some kind of information about any hospital, physician, or healthcare service around. When the likes of companies say healthgrades.com approach a hospital administrator and say, guess what? This year, your orthopedic program earned five stars, but we're not going to tell you how we know that, and if you want to use that information, you have to pay for it. Or the Joint Commission, a prestigious international healthcare accrediting body on whose board I am privileged to serve, says these hospitals earn a gold seal for doing better than these hospitals on certain measures, but which the Joint Commission acknowledges that measurement techniques differ from hospital to hospital to hospital and that often larger, more complex healthcare organizations or safety net hospitals may be disadvantaged by the measuring technique. And what about the government? Are they any more helpful when they tend to use billing data to compare the quality of healthcare organizations? Do their analyses of how hospitals and physicians compare help the public or, public or advocacy groups Unfortunately, the myriad of information available may be doing more to confuse the consumer than help. I think it's a little like measuring a Model T and a Ferrari. Both, depending on the situation, may be much loved, perfectly good cars, but obviously the measurement, the technology, the complexity of each are clearly different. My challenge is this. With all the noise that's out there, what can I as a leader do to instill a culture of learning and collaboration at Carillion so that we welcome critique and envelop the disparate groups in constructive dialogue along a journey of assuring and inspiring good health? Carillion's business model brings together a number of hospitals, physicians, nurses, home health agencies, specialists, even pharmacies, all working together to improve health. We serve urban, suburban, and rural populations in this region. And with all the challenges inherent in meeting the healthcare needs of those diverse populations, we seek to provide the same world-class healthcare to every patient, regardless of that individual's ability to pay. We reinvest every dollar into healthcare services. And we ask ourselves, is it even possible to create a common set of values which guide us as healthcare professionals and as an organization as we seek to serve such a diverse cross-section? Croyon's an integrated health system with more than 800 physicians, specialists, nurse practitioners, and PAs. We operate eight hospitals in five counties. We routinely seek ways to raise the bar. For instance, we have more doctoral prepared clinical nurse specialists at our flagship hospital in Roanoke than any hospital in the Commonwealth. Why? Because we believe that the acute needs of our patients are complex and must be guided by a sophisticated level of nursing expertise. Do we get paid more for that? Nope. Does it improve care? Yeah, we think it does. And we're a major employer providing jobs for nearly 11,000 of your friends and neighbors with an annual payroll exceeding $600 million. Besides providing superb health care services, we, like Virginia Tech, are a major economic engine in Western Virginia. Yeah, all this means we're a pretty large operation. But what's important is this. 
For every individual patient who places his or her trust in us and for the collective communities we serve, the welfare of our patients, our employees, our consumers, and the community is our only reason for being. I think this also means that Carillion, and me by extension, is expected to be a leader in the healthcare field. We must ask ourselves, what are the community's needs and expectations? How do we meet those needs and expectations? And are we earning the community's trust? And on a larger platform, how can we help this great nation meet the health care needs of today and tomorrow? Some of the answers are informed by my own evolution from a consumer of health care to a hands-on practitioner and now to my role as CEO of a large and evolving health care entity. A little secret, I've been in this role less than 100 days. And you're one of my first audiences to talk to, so I hope you will uh, let me know how I'm doing. Because my first priority, internally and externally, is to communicate, communicate, communicate. There's no surefire ways of communicating. Sometimes we have to resort to mass emails, and I think they actually do work. The trick is to use email often enough to be relevant, but not so often as to be considered stuffing a mailbox. And I think email messages must be clear, crisp, and succinct so as to provide value and show respect for the reader's time and attention. In one of my first email messages to my colleagues at Carillion, I talked about the importance of our mission to improve the health of the communities we serve. And I invited everyone to take initiatives to improve their own health. In the days and months ahead, I'll be adding ways for us to be accountable first for our own health. Such things as assuring that healthy snacks are available, walking programs, smoking cessation programs, changes to our health insurance. In fact, or in effect, I'm trying to serve our employees as a first measure of my leadership. Another 21st century communication tool is the ability to do sh short videos and storytelling and place them on the intranet. In a video message to my colleagues, I provided this gem of personal information during my first couple of weeks as the new CEO. When I was five years old, Santa brought me a nurse's cap and a nurse's kit. And I decided right then and there, December 25th, that I wanted to be a nurse. Absolutely true story. And the other thing that Santa brought me was a dog, and I've had a pet ever since. Now, most of those pets have had a lot of love and all my attention, but I'm pretty sure they led me instead of me leading them. As you may know, I was born in Roanoke, in fact, at Roanoke Memorial Hospital. I was a volunteer candy striper. And there's something about this region, these mountains, these valleys, these people, that makes me want to call this region home. This is where I belong. When I started my career almost four decades ago, I felt that way, and I feel every bit as strongly about that today. While I choose, chose to serve patients as a nurse when I was five, my experiences as a patient when I was a teenager likely guided my perceptions of how medical personnel ought to interact with patients. I had a large bone tumor in my left leg, originally thought to be cancer. Following surgery, the diagnosis was thankfully found to be erroneous. Regardless, I spent the better part of a year in a wheelchair or on crutches or a non-weight-bearing long leg cast. Unfortunately, 15 months later, the tumor grew back, and I went through the same surgery and long recovery. Why tell you this personal story? In part, it's who I am. And in part, to share with you a few of the wonderful and maybe one or two of the not so wonderful examples I experienced of service. On the not so good side, 
I found myself isolated. Few of the staff or physicians wanted to talk to me. No one acknowledged my fears. Even my parents couldn't be in the same room with me without clamming up or crying. I felt abandoned, alone, and afraid. Following surgery, I was in the hospital for about three months. And I was a teenager, did I mention that? Used to long, hour, long hot showers and washing my hair every day. Being bedridden was a nightmare. So on the, so on the good side, one day, two nurses came into my room, rolled me over to a cart, and put me in the utility room where they washed and styled my hair. And then they rolled me out to the roof so that I could sunbathe, and they had pizza for me. Now, you know what? These nurses were every bit as tired, overworked, and stressed as any other. But they cared enough to show compassion to work as a team, and to care for me as a person first, not as a patient or a whiny teenager. As a nurse, I was made head nurse within 20 months of graduating, responsible for about 26 staff members and 30 patients. No, I wasn't a nurse prodigy back then. There were so few RNs that most of my colleagues had supervisory positions within two years of graduating. I could spend the rest of the evening telling you about some of the stories of those early days. Let me tell you one. A week or two before Christmas, a patient came to us. He was a young man. I'll call him John. He had been battling cancer for about a year, and he had been doing well. But he came to us 10 days before Christmas with pneumonia. We loved having John because most of the patients on our floor were older, and uh, we had a lot of fun with John. And we had a lot of fun together, too, and we decided since most of our patients couldn't go home for Christmas, we wanted to bring Christmas to our patients. So we worked together and made little goodie bags and presents for all our patients. And uh, I was responsible for getting roses. We thought all of our patients should have roses. And, uh, admittedly, most of our patients were also women. So I came to work on Christmas morning about 6 o'clock, had my arms full of red roses and one yellow. And I'm excited and chatting, and I can't wait to share all of our goodies with our patients. And I tell my staff, who seem very quiet and subdued, I've got red roses for everybody, but I've got a yellow rose for John, because I didn't think John would like a girly red rose. And in the back of my mind, I heard somebody say, Nancy, and I just chatted on, oh, and this is going to be so great, and I think we ought to go see John first because he's the youngest and we can take all this, and come on, let's get going, Nancy. Come on, guys, what's wrong with you? Let's go. Where's John's present? Here's this yellow flower. Do we have a vase? Nancy. And I looked up and I said, what? And they said, we're sorry to tell you this, but John died last night. And you know, I walked down the hall, and one of our aides came beside me, put her arm around me, and said, let's take a walk. And we did, and we talked a little bit, and we cried a little bit. And then she said, we got to get back to work. And I said, yep, you're right. And we did. And I think this story shares with you a lot about what servant leadership is, and it isn't always about the leader. I think this story shares with you the notion of putting people first, and sometimes the person's the leader. It shares with you compassion and collaboration and caring for one another. We worked together as a team to plan and celebrate Christmas. We worked together as a team to reflect on a patient who we cared about, and we were sad to lose our patient. But we set priorities, and we got back in the saddle, as it were, in short order, because the rest of our patients were just as important, and they needed us despite our sadness. Communication one with the other and with patients isn't easy, but it's critically important. Here at Virginia Tech might be a good example of the importance of communication as well. 
When pets come to the veterinary hospital, the veterinary students are required to provide twice daily phone calls to the pet owners. One obvious reason for providing these updates is that the owners want to know how their pets are doing. But a less obvious and equally important goal of these calls is to provide these really smart, really bright young people with some practical experiences in talking to real people about complicated science and health conditions. A few years ago, my dog was a patient at Virginia Tech, and one young student had the unfortunate responsibility to give me a call and let me know that while my dog was in surgery, he wasn't going to get better. The student helped me make the difficult decision to let my little dog sleep on a permanent basis. So, you've learned a little bit about me. Maybe you've learned more than you ever wanted to know and my career and what I think is important. I feel the elements of what is now described as servant leadership may have been a part of my own DNA and my evolution as a leader since my earliest days. My role as CEO has caused me to be more focused on Carillion's mission, our people, and our challenges and I find myself increasingly reliant on the principles of servant leadership. Greenleaf describes leadership as a person who serves first. Sipe and Frick have evolved Greenleaf's work, suggesting a solid foundation of organizational strategy and culture built around certain principles that support community, employees, and customers. Their work describes a servant leader as one who puts people first. A leader is a person of character. A servant leader is ethical and principled. A servant leader displays a servant heart. A servant leader is a skilled communicator who listens earnestly and speaks effectively. A servant leader is a compassionate collaborator who supports diversity and creates a sense of belonging. A servant leader has foresight and imagines possibilities. A servant leader anticipates the future, proceeds with purpose, provides for reflection. A servant leader is a systems thinker who thinks and acts strategically. A servant leader leads change effectively. A servant leader considers the greater good. A servant leader leads with moral authority, is worthy of respect, inspires trust and confidence, and creates a culture of accountability. I aspire to these wise and strong characteristics of a leader. I don't always get it right. And in fact, I find it rather awkward to talk about myself as if I could achieve any of these things. But the guidepost of leading in order to see to the priority needs of others is a conscious choice I make. I continually ask myself, does my leadership serve our organization so that it's better, healthier, wiser? Five years ago, Carillion embarked on a journey to move away from the traditional hospital model to an integrated approach to health care. We aspire to help our patients spend less time in the hospital and more time with physicians and other caregivers in a healthy environment. In doing so, Carillion was ahead of the nation in terms of how we believe that health care could be more effectively provided and administered. We were, and still are, only a handful of hospitals that embrace the concept of true physician leadership as critical to improving quality and improving the patient's experience. In many ways, this is the essence of servant philosophy, attention, attending to the needs of others and to those we serve. My job is to provide the resources for this team of wonderfully talented, smart, healthcare professionals so that they can provide the highest value and quality through an integrated system of care. Let me say that again. My job as a servant leader is to make sure we have the right people and the right jobs, those folks have the resources they need, and then importantly, get out of their way so they can take care of patients. 
We are creating a culture within Carilion where every caregiver aspires to provide the best care characterized by personalized, convenient, collaborative, friendly, high-quality services. In sum, we want to put the personal back in personal health care. We want to constantly challenge ourselves to think about how can we do it differently? How do we do it better? How can we do it more economically? We want to be an organization where we take risks without being reckless. We've developed an innovative partnership with an insurance provider, Aetna, which we believe has the potential to revolutionize the insurance health system relationship by fostering medical homes and promoting wellness. Together, we are truly seeking to do things better, differently, and more economically. Now, if anyone in the audience knows about the historical relationships between health systems and insurance companies, you can imagine that some in our organization wondered if we had gone off the deep end by getting in bed with an insurance company. But we feel very positive about taking this risk, and we believe it provides a useful backdrop for our entire organization to be active participants in the continuing evolution to an integrated health system. I think it may be a good example and even a practical op application in the real world of having foresight and being a systems thinker, two characteristics of servant leadership. Before I close, I want to speak directly to the concept called servant leadership. For some, it may be viewed as abstract, theoretical, even soft, with, pra with little practical value in the real world. But I think that servant leadership is a lifelong journey that includes discovery of oneself, a desire to serve others, and a commitment to lead. I've been reflecting a lot on servant leadership, and I've come to call it a still magnolia version of leadership. On the one hand, there's beauty. On the other hand, strength. At Carillion, this is what motivates us. We are part of the communities we serve. In partnership with our community, we work towards improving the health of the regions. We do so with an emphasis on collaboration, teamwork, focus, integration, and fiscal responsibility. We embrace the opportunity to lead this region in its own health care journey. We believe that a healthy community isn't just about hospitals, physicians, nurses, home health agencies, pharmacists, nursing homes. It's all that, but it's more. It's about 9-11 and EMS services. It's about mental health services. It's about substance abuse programs, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, safe schools, an educated workforce. It's the rescue mission, the Salvation Army. It's clean water. It's universities and colleges. It's parks and tra trails and greenways. In other words, it's all of us working together with the single-minded goal of a healthy community for life. A big part of leading is outreach and collaboration, which is one of the reasons I was pleased to be invited to this kickoff series for Community Voices. I want to thank you again for having me, and I look forward to the question and answer part of our program.